Uh, Mr. Smalley, do you believe that abortion is moral? Oh, boy. <clears throat> I'm glad I'm debating him instead of you. This is Apologetics Live. To answer your questions, your host from Striving for Eternity Ministries, Andrew Rappaport. All right. Welcome to Apologetics Live. We are live Thursday night here to answer your questions typically, but not tonight. Tonight is one of these nights where we have a formal debate. And when we have formal debates, we do not have participants and therefore, you can put comments. We will read the comments as they come in. And if there's time at the end, we will take your comments and ask them to the panels for discussion. So if you do have comments, just put them in. We'll, I'll be monitoring for them. Uh, this is, again, Apologetics Live. We're here every Thursday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we usually will answer any kind of questions. James White is busting on me that my green screen is gone and I no longer have a brick wall. I will get a better green screen <laughs> instead of my empty books. As we'll see when we bring Anthony in, he can now brag. He has more books on his bookshelf than I do, um, but oh well. So uh, with that, <laughs> uh, we we are going to try to not do too many announcements here because we want to get right to debate, give the, the guys as much time as they they uh, so that they can have all the time to use. So, uh, but just to mention to check out strivingfraternity.org, uh, the stuff we have going on now that you're in, you know, confinement like the rest of the world, uh, it's a good time to go to strivingfraternity.org, check out the academy classes that we have for free. It is a good time to just sit around, take some classes, and get some, some education. Uh, I'm going to bring in so the topic tonight is. Uh, the, the formal topic that, that, that was agreed upon, as I try to look for it, is evolution scientifically possible? That is the topic. On the pro is, I'm going to bring him in, is Patrick Dennis. Um, Patrick, I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, can you hear me just fine? Yes, we do. Okay. I just wanted to make sure, since I've been shuffling... Uh, uh, Chrome tabs and screens around. I didn't muck anything up. Uh, well, I am a undergraduate uh, degree holder in microbiology. I went to the University of Texas at Arlington about 20 years ago, graduated with the bachelor's degree in 1999, uh, major microbiology, minor in chem. Uh, and then about five years ago, I completed a master's degree thesis independent re research project in uh, biological sciences department there at Texas Tech. And uh, I focused on cancer biology. So that's my background. And I guess get started now after my dog quits scratching. Well, I'm going to bring Anthony in to introduce himself. So hold okay. on. And here we'll bring Anthony in. Go ahead and introduce yourself before we start with openings. Hi, I'm Anthony Silvestro. For those of you who don't know me, um, my undergrad, I uh, was a dual major in math and chemistry and went on to dental school. You're not really a doctor. Wait a minute. I'm not a real doctor. I'm a dentist. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. Just a dentist. <laughs> not a real doctor. That's okay. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I was an evolutionist for a year about 11 years ago now. And um, I can see absolutely clearly. And there's questions that I wish I would have asked years ago and didn't know to ask them. Um, of any biology teacher I ever had, both in high school, college, and dental school. Okay. We are going to be concerned about your internet because it was breaking up a bit. You, uh, if, we, if it continues, you may have to turn yourself off camera, but make sure there's no one in your house like watching movies or trying to figure out how to, you know, watching YouTube videos on how to save red cardinals. All right. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, I will bring in Patrick, and uh, the way we're going to do this, folks, is we're going to have, uh, for folks who are regulars here at Apologetics Live, you know how we do the, the debates. It's going to be a 10-minute opening. Patrick is on the pro, so he's going to start. He'll do a 10-minute opening. Anthony will do a 10-minute opening. Patrick will do a 15-minute cross-examination, followed by Anthony with a 15-minute cro cross-examination, uh, sorry, rebuttal. Sorry, 15-minute rebuttals. 
Then they will have 20 minutes each for cross-examinations. The way that we do the cross-examinations, they will each get one minute to ask a question. And then they, the opposing person has two minutes to answer the questions. Um, if a question is not answered, uh, the person can say that they didn't feel it was answered. The time doesn't count against them. The person has two minutes to, to answer that question. And the one minute is not a time where people can ask questions or make statements. It is a time for asking questions. So if either of the people end up not answering questions, I will call either side out. If either side of them is uh, making a statement during the one minute question, I'll call them out. We, we want to make sure that we do that. And then after that, there'll be a 10 minute closing. Patrick will start and then Anthony will finish. If there's time left, any questions that I see in the, in the comments, uh, we will be asking them. And so, uh, Chris Hanholds asked the first question. He just says, wait, we're quarantined. Okay. So he must live somewhere where he's not. All right. So with that, <laughs> let me get our clock going. The clock will disappear and only appear in the last two minutes. Uh, so let's get this ready. Are you ready, Patrick? Sure. All right. Go for it. Okay. So what I want to start out by showing is these pictures from uh, the two science journals, Nature and Science. Um, and I really just do do that to start off. I'm trying to demonstrate the relationship of ev evolutionary biology and other disciplines in biology. Uh, but, well, let me start over. <laughs> A little interruption there. I really just do this to uh, demonstrate that there are some aspects of biology that creationists are accepting of, such as biotechnology. Uh, the sequencing of the coelacanth genome uh, would be one example of biotechnology. Okay. And there are other aspects of biology that they aren't accepting of, such as insect phylogeny. Okay. That's basically a cover of of a journal that's talking about a paper where they worked out some of the evolutionary relationships between different types of insects. But obviously the study on the right relied heavily on the same sort of technology uh, on the, as, as sequencing and, and other things like that. So there's really no conflict within the holder, the wider broad field of biology between evolutionary biology and the techniques they use, they all synergize with one another. And there's just, you know, no sense for saying something like DNA disproves evolution or, you know, when DNA sequencing is one of the primary techniques used in evolutionary biology these days. And I live next to the train tracks. So if you're having problems hearing me, let me know and I'll yell. Uh, what evolution is, is really just the study of biodiversity. So I think I'll, I'm going to have to spend a large amount of time talking about what evolution isn't, just to save time of uh, the opposing side talking about how evolution doesn't coincide with this observation or that observation when evolution has nothing to do with that particular thing. You might as well complain that... Uh, Evolu you can't really say that evolution isn't scientific and then say it because it doesn't explain why the sky is blue. Well, it's not meant to explain certain things. So that's not really a valid criticism. Uh, one of those examples that you commonly see online and social media is uh, the conflation of evolution with the biochemical origin of life. So evolution, just as a starting point needs a population of imperfectly re replicating genetic union, units. Could it could be organisms, cells, animals, plants, viruses, as we're learning about right now. Uh, it needs a population. It doesn't discuss how those populations came to be. It needs something in the starting gate, and that's a genetic unit that can reproduce. And that genetic unit or population needs to reproduce imperfectly. Otherwise, we would just be talking about carbon clones and there would be no need to talk about evolution because they would always stay the same from generation to generation. Uh, another thing that evolution isn't is uh, it's not predicated on an incre increase in complexity or information. 
It may actually result in those, but those are consequences, not predicates. So uh, a good example that would illustrate this is saying, which is, which is more complex and which has more information? A tetrapod limb on the left, I think that's a mouse paw, or a lobe finned fish limb on the right. All tetrapods are descended from lobe finned fishes, but I don't really know how you're going to say one is more complex or has more information in it than the other. Okay, uh, this slide actually deals with something that, my, that evolution is, and it's also a clarification of terms. Microevolution, that's variation at the subspecies level, or if you want to talk about something that's current events, uh, COVID-19, uh, a strain, things that may differ based on just a few nucleotides or sets of uh, genomic loci. Uh, would define a strain, and we can determine how strains of COVID-19 have propagated across the globe based on DNA sequencing. In other words, we have imperfectly re replicating genetic units that uh, vary as they reproduce from generation to generation. On the left is just different varieties of tiger. They're all the same species of tiger. They're just separated by uh, uh, ge geographic uh, <clears throat> locations, so they do uh, uh, start to acquire some of their own isolated traits through that uh, isolation in, into separate gene pools. Okay, so I've defined, shown you what microevolution is, and now we get into some of the gray areas that maybe some people don't understand as well. Okay, speciation is actually mi macroevolution. So you, a lot of times you may talk, think that macroevolution really only applies to, say, comparing mammals to reptiles to insects or whatever. Okay, so I have here uh, 20 examples of different species of lady beetle. They're all different species. They don't intermingle in terms of their reproduction. Uh, maybe if you found species that were geographically very near each other that were derived from a recent common ancestor, you might be able to find that. But on the whole, they're isolated uh, reproductive populations and their, their species. And that is the cutoff point for macroevolution in terms of uh, the scientific definition. Any, you know, if you talk about different orders, different classes, different phyla, that's also macroevolution. But those uh, categories and those levels uh, start and become established at the level of speciation. Okay, now let's talk about the acceptance of evolution throughout different uh, forms of creationism. Uh, I'm really not concerned with the two models on the left. Uh, what I really want to focus on here is the uh, third one, which is sort of the AIG Ken Ham model and uh, the BioLogos model, which are the evolutionary creationists or the theistic evolutionists uh, on the far right. Uh, as you can see, there are some differences, but there are also some commonalities. They all have sort of a, they're all demonstrating or sort of trying to portray or convey what happens as a result of spe speciation in the form of a branching motif. And the only difference is, is that the young earth creationists typified by Kim Ham and AIG sort of have a orchard or an orchard model, and that's they typically use the terminology of kinds or created kinds. Each one of those four stems at the bottom are consequence of a special creation, they claim. Whereas the uh, evolutionary creationists, theistic evolutionists, as well as just the agnostic biologists, all look at uh, evolution in terms of unified clades. And the only way that the, the, the only reason that the two models vary is because the uh, young earth creationists set an arbitrary 
point by, sorry, my dog's distracting me, <clears throat> by breaking those uh, groups up. Okay, let me shut her up. You shut up. Okay, so, uh, in other words, just to sum up, they have very, very similar uh, attributes. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. Why is it not appearing? Okay. Okay. So, let me focus in on this particular slide. This is a slide that Ken Ham used in his debate with Bill Nye. And he put up his, you know, just like the previous slide, he's got four or uh, five or he's got six this time. The previous slide had four, four uh, stems. This has six stems representing different types of animals that he thinks were created kinds. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is just uh, ceratopsians, prehistoric non-avian dinos. And he think he's using this graph or diagram to show that all subsequent ceratopsians are just derived from an initially uh, created pair. Okay, time. Uh, Genesis, right? That's time. Pardon? That was time. Okay. That was 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Well, I've got a little bit left over for my closing. Okay. Sure. I didn't rehearse that very well. Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. I, and I paused it when your dog was barking, so <laughs> no worries with that. I, I didn't. I didn't count it against you. All right. Let me bring Dr. Silvestro in, and your clock starts when you're ready. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Go. First of all, I want to thank Patrick for agreeing to be here today to debate this topic at hand, and I want to thank Andrew for being willing to host and moderate this debate for us. Second, my primary purpose is that I desire to see Patrick saved. Look, for both people who know me, I don't care for doing debates, um, but I do them in situations like this because my heart is to see the lost saved. Patrick, we're both sinners, meaning we've both broken God's laws and deserve just punishment and hell for eternity. But in God's grace, he sent his son to pay the penalty, die the death that we deserve. Through his death on the cross, burial, and resurrection, he paid that penalty in full for those who repent and believe the gospel. Molecules demand evolution is just a way for people such as myself at one time and such as yourself today to suppress the truth about the creator God that you'll be held accountable to without excuse when you die. Now for the topic at hand today, is evolution scientifically possible? It makes sense that we define our terms right off the bat. So Patrick, I, I, I commend you at, at starting to define some of the terms, um, although we have some disagreements here. So if by evolution, we mean a generic definition of change over time, Patrick and I would agree that generically change does happen over time. If by evolution, we mean some type of change within a biblical kind, like what secular science tries to explain in scientific journals, such as natural selection, adaptation, the like, we would also somewhat to mostly agree that those concepts can be scientific, at least to a degree. However, what we are debating today is whether molecules to man evolution called macroevolution by many, is scientifically possible? And to that question, I give a resounding no. In order to lay out my argument, we need to define the term science. According to Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, the, defi the definition of science is knowledge attained through study or practice, or knowledge covering general truths of the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through scientific method and concerned with the physical world. According to the Science Council, science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. So from these two sources, as well as every other source that I've checked, science is defined by knowledge gained through the scientific method. Therefore, science knowledge is not gained through hypothetical ideas, philosophical musings, or even one's imagination. What then is the scientific method by which we can do real science? The scientific method consists of usually six steps according to most places. <clears throat> Number one, make an observation and define purpose. Number two, construct hypotheses <clears throat> based off of that. Number three, test that hypothesis and collect data. 
Number four, analyze that data. With that data, we're going to draw a conclusion and then communicate those results. We must then, if our test showed that our hypothesis seems to be right according to one test, we must have lots of repetition, repeat these tests over and over again. We must critically analyze these tests. There must be falsibility or falsif falsifiability to these tests, by the way. And then in that, we verify through this testing. And not just us, but it has to have critical exposure to scrutiny, peer review, and assessment. So in simple terms, for anything to be scientific, according to scientists, a hypothesis must be made from an observation and that a hypothesis must be run through the scientific method with multiple repeatable and verifiable results in order to call something a theory. That's science. Every, def every definition, every journal out there, that's science. However, there's a clarification needs to be made here. What we just talked about is called experimental science. There are actually two types of science, experimental, which we just established, and something called historical. Experimental science, where one would use the scientific method, is catastrophically problematic for the molecules to man evolutionist. One of my first questions to Patrick during the Q&A time will deal with this very issue. I will ask him this question. He's going to know ahead of time. Has it ever been observed that, any, that one kind of animal has ever evolved into another kind? Examples would include an ape-like creature evolving to a man. How about a chicken or a bird from a dinosaur, as nearly every zoo in America claims? And while I'm not a prophet, if he's being honest, his answer will be no. When I ask the next question, why not? He will most likely say that not enough time has passed to observe this macroevolution to occur. In using experimental science, the person is trying to test an observation today that is repeatable. But macroevolution is not observable, let alone testable and repeatable. Molecules man evolution isn't actually scientific according to the standards not set forth by me, but set forth by scientists in scientific journals all over the world for decades. So because of this, historical science must be employed to see if molecules man evolution is even possible. Historical science uses observations made today that are testable and repeatable to try and guess what happened in the past, like molecules man evolution. An example of historical science would be trying to figure out the perpetrator in an unsolved murder and then bringing that person to trial where there's no eyewitnesses. The detective must utilize clues that can be observed and test them to try and figure out who the murderer was. This circumstantial evidence at best can possibly provide a very good guess as to who the murderer was. At worst, it wrongly convicts someone who is innocent. This means that the circumstantial evidence can lead to a completely wrong conclusion. In the case of molecules and man evolution, because it is not scientific from an experimental science perspective, let's be honest, you can't observe it. The only way to determine if it is scientific is if we can test things today that may contribute to evolution. Thus, within the historical science fantasy of molecules man evolution, we can attempt to use experimental science to test things we can actually observe in the present. While molecules demand evolution has many aspects to it, we can boil everything down to its mechanism of action. On the most basic level, getting to the micro details of molecules demand evolution, how does it supposedly work? If I can demonstrate that the supposed mechanism of molecules demand evolution isn't science, then I will have won the debate. Throughout the course of today, we will do just that. While this is enough to destroy molecules man evolution and show that it isn't scientifically possible, there's more. Have you noticed that evolutionists always want to start with a single, simple cell? We saw this in Patrick's opening. This is predictable. Why? Because they all do this. It's because they have another catastrophic problem. This is why. Scientists estimate that an average single cell has 100 trillion atoms. Here's the catastrophic problem. How did trillions of non-living atoms arise at the exact same time, in the exact same place, coalesce into billions of molecules, proteins, and machines that have very specific design and function, and then form a living cell that can take in nutrients, metabolize, excrete waste products, and reproduce. Here's a clue. They didn't. And scientists know that. In fact, the statistics show it is impossible for a single medium-length essential protein 
to be able to form impossible in the billions of years this universe has been around, let alone all the proteins necessary for life. See, one very modest protein or functional protein probability would this the size of this would be 150 amino acids. The probability of a 150 chain amino acid protein, a moderate size protein to form is one in 10 to the 164th power for one protein to form. The simplest form of life has 300 to 400 of these proteins, simplest cell possible, which means that take 10 to the 164th power and multiply that by three to 400. That's insane. You're talking the improbability. NASA's improbability statistic is ten to the fiftieth power. the The amount of known particles in the entire universe is somewhere around ten to the eightieth power, and yet we've got a power for we've got one protein to form is is one chance in ten to the one hundred sixty fourth power. It's it's insanely impossible. See, non life pond scum turning into life isn't scientific. It's magic. So not only do evolutionists not have a mechanism for molecules and man evolution to work, and they ignore the problem of how life originated and how the supposed first cell coming to be, they also disregard one other thing. Where did all the matter in the universe come from that is needed for molecules and man evolution to be able to, to occur? There's only three possibilities. Number one, the universe created itself. That's not scientific. Number two, the universe has always existed. This would require an infinitely old universe. This goes against all known science, like the second law of thermodynamics. So that's not scientific, which leaves us with one possibility. God, the universe was created by God. On every level, evolution is not scientific, has no viable mechanism, can't explain how the first cell came into being, and ignores how all the matter came into existence in the first place. Time. Thank you. All right. Put you back. All right. Let me reset the clock here, Patrick. And while I do, it'd be a time I could let you know that if you um, you had a couple more slides, do, do you want to use them in your rebuttal at all? Just so I know. Uh, well, no, because I can just refer back to them. Ones that are relevant, you've already seen. Okay. Yep. Just wanted to know whether to just do that. All right. You I, appreciate, let me know. I appreciate the question, but uh, we'll try to do without it. Okay. Uh, 15 minutes when you're ready. Okay, so, well, you know what? Given that amount of time, I thought we were in the two minute back and forth. Can you just turn it back on? Yep. Uh, okay. This is this is a rebuttal. So it really has to. It has. Does it have to specifically address something he said? And I hope we're not timing now because we're just trying no, to. Uh, I, stopped right I stopped the clock. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna run your time when we're asking a question of of format. No, we, we you could if you if you feel that there's some rebuttal you want to rebuttal. To his his opening, but if you feel that your slides are gonna to help with, yeah, okay, let's just go on with that. Let's just act like uh, I'm finishing up, but it's still relevant to the rebuttal. So let's just put my slides back on right. and go from there. You and do. if you feel like if you feel like I'm deviating from the format, just let me know, and I'll try to rephrase or re redirect my course. Okay, you ready? Okay, sure. Okay, so uh, I knew molecules to man would come up. Uh, it's just something uh, maybe for a question and answer section coming up later. I, I defined evolution. It's an exploration and examination of biodiversity. I told you what you need. Did we lose him? Do you hear him, Anthony? I brought you in for a second. Let me stop his clock. I, I don't hear anything, no. Okay. Uh, one of the things with technology, folks, I, I stopped his clock there. Um, I will try to reach out to him. So um, we do know that with everybody home watching the internet everywhere, or on the internet everywhere, some people have been noticing issues. Um, oh, I'm sure there's problems within uh, <laughs> with a, a lot of the guys out there, or a lot of the internet companies and people bombarding. Yeah. Well, 
Okay, we'll wait, we're going to wait for him to come back in. Um, yeah, I, I will say, you know, that um, it, it has been a thing with everyone working from home and binging Netflix. Um, <laughs> the the fact that uh, there hasn't been more problems with the internet uh, has actually been <laughs> has has been good. I guess it shows that uh, you know some of the companies have really uh, done a good job. So I'll, I'll go back. Uh, this has nothing to do with the debate. So uh, I'll bring this up for your sake, Anthony, until we wait for him to come in. Jess says, as a dental assistant myself, I'd love to work alongside a dentist who loves God. What a good day it'd be at work. Uh, so I, I kind of described, you know, before you sold your practice, uh, that most of your staff were believers and and uh, basically every patient heard the gospel. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Not to make Jess feel jealous or anything, you know. Yeah, because you know, it's one thing to find a dentist who's Christian, which is wonderful to have, but it's another, you know, when you're allowed to openly speak about. It. I know a lot of, I, I know a number of Christian dentists and doctors who um, keep it under their vest. <laughs> they won't yeah. talk about it at all. So, so Justin Pierce w wants to know if it's, or says it would be awesome if I got saved. Um, James Watkins is just surprised that I know what Netflix actually is. Yeah, I am too, actually. Um, <laughs> Jess says, I couldn't imagine Jelly Belly. Uh, it's hard to find. Um, you know, some there was a question earlier. Uh, people were were finding it quite amusing with his dog there. Um, but I know Donald Jack somewhere asked the question. Ah, here it is. He said, "What kind of dog do you have, Patrick?" And just in case Patrick didn't see it, he put "kind" then in all caps on a second one, um, just to make sure he he saw. It. Okay, here he comes. He's back in. Cool. Okay. Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, they I don't know what happened to my internet. Not a problem. It just uh, pooped out. So are you like on your phone now with a... Yeah, I had to switch to my uh, uh, phone's hotspot. And usually I play, I play video games on that, so it's pretty reliable. Maybe right. even better than my house's internet connection. All right, well, right now it looks like... I don't know, black screen. We don't see your picture anymore, but, um, okay. Well, I need to set that up. I did. I only got to where I could actually hear you guys. And, and yeah. Uh, now for folks who don't know, you, you did say, you know, you've been quarantined and you didn't get a haircut. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, there I am in all my glory. Uh, made my son cut my hair. So if you want me to send it to your place, he can, <laughs> No, dude, you just need to shave it at this point. All right. I, my wife won't let me. I would go complete bald, but <laughs> Don, Donald Jax would love it. All right. I stopped your clock. So we're going to, I'm going to actually reset your time there, Patrick. Okay. It, it, I think, so are you seeing my screen now? Um, I'm not. Wait. Okay. Let me work on that a little bit more. Oh, I have to put the, sh actually hit the share button. Oop. And. Okay, and then I have to select what I want to show too. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna, Anthony, I'll put there you. There we go. Stage. I will bring Patrick up there. Okay, so we're gonna start you over in time. Okay. Um, up here, I do have the question still on screen. Daniel Jacks was asking, "What kind of dog do you have?" He highlighted the word "kind" for you. Uh, she's a uh, yeah, right. <laughs> she right. is a uh, same species as a wolf. Uh, but she is the Australian Shepherd variety. All right, micro, through micro variation. <laughs> and right. breeding. Some someone actually wanted a hyper hypersensitive dog that uh, barks at everything. All right, you ready? You ready to start? Yep. In a few minutes. Yep. Okay, go. Okay, so let's just look back at the uh, little more informative version. This is the actual slide Ken Ham used in the uh, debate with Bill Nye. I can't remember. Was that 2014? Something like that. And he's got one particularly interesting example here. Uh, first, it's uh, Triceratops, and he has got some putative evolutionary relationships uh, drawn up there. I think, I think the blue lines that cut across all of the uh, uh, kinds or the uh, 
reduction in, in varieties brought about by uh, Noah's flood. And then obviously because they're Triceratops and Ceratopsians went extinct, uh, their lines don't go much further after Noah's flood. Uh, interestingly enough, of all of the Tricerat or Ceratopsian fossils we have, we have just this huge diversity that you can see on the right. Now these aren't subspecies, they aren't uh, just variations of a single uh, type or variety. These are all separate species. They're all reproductively isolated from one another. This is macroevolution. Therefore, Ken Ham and I, AIG's model for biodiversity incorporates macroevolution, whether they want to admit it or not. Okay, and I think I've already said those statements. I put them up there just to make an emphasis, but there they are again. Okay, so let's shift uh, shift the uh, ball. Let's hand the ball off to the theistic evolutionists and just the agnostic biologists and look at all these varieties. Okay, we have two mammals, two archosaurs. That would be the non-avian dinosaur and the bird. Okay, and then three reptiles. That's the lizard on the right, the ceratopsian and the bird, and then it looks like one amphibian. Okay, now the same sorts of traits that you use to group dog kind or monkey kind or whatever else you want to call these together can be derived. You can derive, you can extract other traits out of those six that are there, as I've already done in a little bit. Two of them are mammals. Well, if you're going to group all of the uh, dog kind together based on their dog-like traits, well, why can't you group uh, mammals together based on their mammal-like traits? And that's what one of the slides does uh, later on. Uh, it seemed like early on, uh, Andrew sort of equated evolution with atheism. I have a few examples here of uh, evolutionist scientists that are Christians and various denominations. They still use evolution to make predict testable predictions in their work. One of them is Mary Schweitzer. She's probably most familiar to uh, a lot of young earth creationists or creationists because she's on the forefront of the uh, soft tissue and fossils research. She has some very interesting quotes for creationists who, who misuse her work to make various uh, claims. Uh, another is Francis Collins, uh, director of the NIH. He's also uh, heavily involved. I'm not sure, quite sure what his status is with the Biologus organization. Um, once again, he is also an evolutionist, so there's no contradiction. Either, you know, it's, I'm just trying to deflate the straw man of evolution equals uh, atheism because it's just not the case. Um, <clears throat> Kenneth Miller is another one. Okay. Uh, several of my friends I cross paths with on Facebook and social media uh, put this together, this work, this book together. Uh, it's dealing with geology, but there are some, uh, you know, evolutionary overtones when you talk about the different sorts of animals and how uh, in different strata along the Grand Canyon walls that are explained by evolution rather than some creation event. Uh, I think Ken, Wal Ken Wolgamuth is one. I think you're uh, Andrew's friends with him on Facebook. I, th I think I noticed the other day. Uh, and where are we, where are we time-wise? Good Lord. Hello? Yeah, no, I, I posted it up there. You have nine minutes, 35 seconds. Sorry. Oh, really? Okay, sorry. You meant you heard me uh, venting. Um, if I have that long, let me just go on. Let's, 
let's i i found a, i saw a very curious post from uh, anthony and i guess i thought maybe i called you andrew a few times i apologize uh, uh the other day in the facebook group where we first met uh he he wanted people to come look at the uh is genus history movie now this follows up with the uh diagram from aig that i Ken Ham used in his debate with uh, uh, Bill Nye several years back. Uh, there is a section where Dell Tackett spends a lot of time with uh, uh, Todd Wood, biologist. He is a, a PhD biologist, and he's sort of the resident uh, baromenologist, which is the creationist version of uh, uh, phylogeneticists. Uh, there's a section where he and Dale spent a lot of time at the uh, zoo looking at the, the various animals and uh, foo-fooing the, the evolutionary explana explanation for their biodiversity. Uh, on the one hand, I respect that because they are actually talking about, or at least Todd Wood is actually talking about what evolution is supposed to address, which is uh, biodiversity and not the uh, biochemical origin of cells or whether the sky is blue or whether evolution explains that or uh, why can't evolution make my car run better or anything like that. He's sticking to the topic. Um, so there are some very choice quotes from Todd Wood on his blog and some of them go into uh, fall along the lines of there is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it. Uh, it's not just speculation or a faith choice or an assumption or a religion. It is a productive framework for lots and lots of biological research. There has really been no failure of evolution as a scientific theory. And the people who, who dismiss or foo-foo evolution uh, probably are just unacquainted with what it's actually supposed to address or what the actual evidence is. Uh, he, he finishes by saying an ex extremely successful scientific theory. And then he, he wraps up something which I, I also respect very much in, in concluding that his rejection of evolution is a faith choice that he chooses to make when uh, he, he has a Bible in his left hand and uh, Campbell's biology textbook in his right hand. He is making a faith choice to accept what the Bible says, regardless of the evidence. And if every creationist said that, I probably wouldn't spend as much time being the way I am. So where are we at right now, time-wise? We're at six minutes. Okay. So once I've sort of gotten those hurdles out of the way, let's just talk about something that evolution addresses uh, specifically and is not, you know, is actual science. And I'll show you some of the nuts and bolts of the science. All it's going to be a very uh, rudimentary crash course. Uh, and it sort of helps dispel some of the, straw man that I often hear. So a lot of times when you talk about, uh, say, humans and non-human apes or uh, birds and non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs, you'll just hear constantly that that's just based on similarities. Uh, biological homology is not assessed by a simple side-by-side -side comparison of things. We're concerned with using traits that say what an organism is and, you know, more so than what it does or what color it is or how much it weighs. So we're using tra traits that have a genetic basis. So at the same time, uh, blue eyes, red hair, all of those traits that run in families obviously have a genetic basis. The same thing is true of having a, a backbone or having four limbs. So we don't, we don't just use side-by-side -side comparisons. We actually look at matrices involving several different species and several different traits. And then we can 
derive uh, phylogenetic trees based on those assortment of traits. For instance, starting out here, it's my pointer. We're looking at vertebrae. Okay, the all of these animals are vertebrates, sharks, ray fin fish, amphibians, mammals, reptiles. Uh, and then the next trait oh, that we see is bony skeletons. And one way we can know that bony skeletons is, is a valid trait to proceed to next is just using simple logic like all vertebrates have bony, ske uh, have, uh, bony skeleton, oh, excuse me, all bony skeleton animals are vertebrates, but not all vertebrates are bony skeleton animals. And that excludes sh uh, sharks. So sharks are the first to diverge. Now we can do something with that bit of information. We can look in the fossil record and say, do we see evidence that sharks diverged from bony fish first? And that's actually what we find. And then we can use other traits too, not just to dwell on them too long. The next would logical one would be four limbs. Uh, the next is an am amniotic egg. Uh, and we put, we group all mammals and reptiles based as a group that all have amni amniotic eggs. They're all amniotes. You might say, hey, humans are mammals. Well, they don't have eggs. Well, the uh, internal placenta is a just a shellless internal derivative of an egg. Uh, that's where the term amniocentesis comes from. We're looking at the the uh, vestigial amnion in the uh, uh, fetus when we do that sort of medical procedure. Uh, once we get these relationships organized, and we're not just looking at them, we come up with a way of uh, reconciling and consolidating all of these groups that AIG claims are separate uh, created kinds. Uh, once again, I don't really understand the logic of saying all wolves are, are related to each other by common an ancestry or all dogs are rather or all apes or whatever, just based on their qualities of having dog-like qualities or ape-like qualities and uh, ignoring all the other associations that you can make. They're all vertebrates. Uh, these are all tetrapods. They all have four limbs. Uh, everybody except the uh, frog is a uh, amniote. So uh, there's no reason to ignore those uh, associations which are testable just because of an arbitrary ambiguous uh, definition of what a kind constitutes. So, you know, this is where some of those associations or groupings that creationists don't like come from. Uh, here's one that has a little bit of a biblical spin on it, uh, just for fun. Snakes and diapsids there in the middle means reptile. Uh, but Snakes are reptiles, obviously, and all reptiles are tetrapods or four-limbed animals. So snakes are technically still four-limbed animals, even though they don't have four limbs. They're just derived from an ancestor that did have four limbs. Uh, actually, snakes are just a leg, legless form of a lizard. They're, they're clustered within the lizard clade. Uh, another one would be uh, birds and diapsids. Okay, technically birds are reptiles based on this classification. You know, we learn Linnaean tex taxonomy in grade school, uh, birds, mammals, amphibians, uh, reptiles, insects, so on. But looking at their shared derived traits, uh, logically we have to conclude that birds are reptiles. There's just time. no other way around it. That's time. And whales are tetrapods too. <laughs> I will bring Anthony back in. I will reset your clock. You have 15 minutes when you're ready. Okay. <clears throat> Go for it. Okay. So as a Christian, I proclaim that we have a reliable eyewitness for how every living thing on this planet came to be by creator God. Furthermore, God did not create a cell and then allowed evolution to take its course. 
Instead, he created everything after its own kind, dogs, cats, chickens, and such. Every kind reproduces after its own kind. And guess what? This is consistent with what we actually observe. Dogs will always produce more dogs, no matter how what new wacky breed we come up with next. A Chihuahua Dane Boxer Retriever is still a dog. Cats will always produce cats, even those mean, evil little house cats. And humans will always produce humans. When Patrick brought up the issue of some Christians that uh, have no problem with evolution, well, you know what? I, as a Christian, have a problem with professing Christians who believe evolution could have been used. Why? Because it goes directly against scripture. It's irreconcilable with scripture. So when a Christian says evolution's possible, we don't say, oh, look, there's a guy who found a way to make them both work. No, we say that guy is a compromiser because he's actually going against scripture to try to get evolution in millions of years stuck into the Bible. Now, when we talk about evolution equating to atheism, Patrick, this is why, is because evolution is not a mechanism of, of a creator God. This is of the creator God. This is, this is a mechanism that is designed by people who hated God back in the day. This is a mechanism that does its best to explain away God or try to explain away God. It's only the foolishness of some professing Christians that try to smash that into the Bible somewhere. We read the Bible and it says that God made each after its own kind and to reproduce after its own kind. So we don't see him taking a kind and making it into all of the other kinds that all over the face of the earth. We don't see that. Um, we look through the Bible and we don't see any evidence of millions to billions of years. We see thousands of years when we just read the Bible, plain as day. So those are some of the issues I have with, with the creationists that are out there. So I maintain uh, creationists that, well, again, people who believe the Bible call themselves creationists but believe in evolution. I have problems with them. Having said all that, I maintain that the scientific speculations about molecules demand evolution are bad. They're self-serving guesses at best, right? I mean, you were taking pictures, Patrick, the same thing all evolutionists do. We don't, they don't, nobody ever talks about the nitty gritty, which we're going to get into here. They just want to put pictures and show how pictures look like other pictures and how certain traits may group in things into other traits. And you know what? That might be good and well for Linnaeus and it might be good and well for taxonomy for us to try to classify organisms and to name them um, by their genus and species. But aside from that, um, there's no science that's actually behind it other than a few observations on just structural issues. So having said that, you know, Patrick, I wanted to hit on something which I knew would come up at some point. You, you said using logic in defending one of the points you're bringing up, using logic. So here's, here's the question I have for you is, is, and this is really for everybody, is has Patrick been speaking with some intelligibility today? I mean, has he been able to form thoughts in his head? Has he been able to reason with those thoughts? Has he been able to communicate those reason thoughts to us by actually controlling his mouth, his tongue, his lungs, and his voice box? If he believes in what he calls the science of molecules demand evolution, then Patrick can only be the result of the exact same things that evolution would, would bring about, which is random chemical reactions that have done nothing but obeying laws of chemistry and physics, which I'm not going to ask where those came from. We're just going to assume they're there. But he'd be relying on those that have gone on for billions of years since the beginning of, of life we know it. That's materialism in its purest sense, right? That everything is the result of millions to billions of random couple of reactions over billions of years doing nothing but obeying laws of chemistry and physics. That means everything started as materials. Everything today is still materials. And if that's true, Patrick, you've got a problem because you obviously are speaking with some intelligence. You obviously are controlling your words. You're controlling your thoughts. You're controlling your reason. You obviously are attempting to use logical arguments the same way I am. 
And yet, how can you account for those? How does a materialistic worldview that produces nothing but materialism all of a sudden lend itself to laws of logic or your ability to think and reason and then be able to control those words? Because on one hand, in an evolutionary worldview, your words would just be the product of random chemical reactions doing nothing but obeying the laws of chemistry and physics. And instead, your words that are coming out, you're controlling. You and I both know that. So does every person who's listening knows that you're controlling every one of those words. The reality is, is that you're using the very process of reasoning that would be discredited in materialism. So here's the big issue, issue of them all, though. So let's put this aside for a moment. In order to determine if evolution is scientifically possible, a person must be able to do science in the first place. In order to do science, you have to rely on your senses. You have to rely on your ability to think. You have to be able to reason and many more things. Yet that contradicts the materialistic worldview that you're trying to prove. And the moment that Patrick or any scientist employs any one of these things, he's actually borrowing from my worldview, the Christian worldview, and one in which we were designed and created in that God gave us these abilities to do these things. It's not the culmination of random chemical reactions that are doing nothing but obeying the laws of chemistry and physics. I think as uh, as I'm going to turn ship now a little bit, I want to rebut a few more of the things that that you had you had brought up, Patrick. the The first thing would be you you keep going back to the that evolution is is just biodiversity, but yet that's I, I and I know definitions have changed continuously in the secular science world because every time we we refute something that is said in secular science. You guys change the definition. We look at the fact there's a Cambrian explosion, right? We have single simple organisms in the cell record and or fossil record. And then we have all of this really complex type of organisms everywhere. Billions of them all buried all over the earth. And we have literally nothing in between. The transitions are gone. Darwin said, the biggest problem to his theory, biggest boon to his theory would be if these transitions were never found. Well, where are they? They're not anywhere to be found. And so in understanding this, this evolution in, in biodiversity, yeah, we, we see that there's all kinds of complex organisms. But in your worldview on evolution, where are all of the transitional fossils? Where are they at? Why do we not see any of these transitions up? All we're seeing is pictures from you of all the animals that we know of today or that are in the fossil record that are already complex. We see nothing that leads up to any of these things. So yeah, evolution is, is biodiversity, but that's different than, than what has been a standard definition of evolution. We have to account for where did everything evolve from going back to the single simple cell that evolutionists claim was there all the way up to complex or organisms we see today. And so this is really the issue that I want to focus on right now. In my opening, I had talked about the issue of where we, we can't observe macroevolution happening, right? All you're shooting is showing pictures. We can't observe these changes happening. The only changes we can see happening is when we look at antibiotic resistant bacteria. Well, guess what? There's still bacteria. That's not, that's not macroevolution to any degree. We're not seeing a kind to another kind. Um, and, and I could bring up many other examples of this. So we can't test scientifically if evolution um, is possible because you can't observe it. So we have to, what do we have to test? We have to test the very mechanism. And so as I've talked to numerous, not just masters, but also PhD level and postdoc um, biologists, evolutionary biologists, genetic biologists, um, I've asked them all the same question. It's this, what is the mechanism for evolution to supposedly work? Because you can throw all these terms at me, natural selection, adaptation, genetic drift, and blah, 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 all kinds of stuff. And the reality, they all rely upon mutations. 
not just any mutations, you need mutations that increase functional genetic information over time. So when you said something, Patrick, about, about information and, and, you know, we always want to focus on the issue of complexity. Well, of course we do, because you're very, not just you, but the scientific community in, in secular science says that all life evolved from that single cell. I want to know how did it happen? How did billions of bits of information get inserted into the genome? Where'd it come from? And this is the thing is there are no observ there's no observable evidence of any mutation ever increasing functional genetic information to the genome. All we find mutations do is they recombine information that's already present or have a net loss of information. Usually it's both. That's the issue. And Patrick, look, you study cancer, right? I mean, and thank you for being a guy who is studying cancer. Cancer is, is horrible. Um, I would love to find find, uh, I would love to be able to say that we found a cure for cancer. This is awesome. But what does cancer represent? It represents bad mutations that happen over and over again, that completely kill off a body. Well, we also have something else called genetic entropy. Why is it, why is it that every successive generation I mean, look, you can look at, you can look at secular scientific journals, not even creation journals. They talk about this idea of genetic entropy. So on one hand, evolution says that somehow information is being added to the genome as time goes on, right? But there's no evidence that the, they've never observed a mutation that has ever increased information, functional genetic information in the genome. They've never observed this. But what they have observed is that genetic entropy occurs, meaning that 50 in humans alone, 50 to 100 new mutations, permanent negative mutations, net loss of information mutations are being introduced in every successive generation. Why? Why are scientists asking the questions about how to stop genetic entropy? Because at some point in the future, we're not going to be around anymore. We're going to be, we're going to be such mutated messes we can't reproduce anymore. Why? It's, it's because of this. There is no evidence on the DNA level, cellular level, however you want to call it, there is no evidence for any mechanism for evolution. All you have are pictures. Having said all that, I'm going to try to address a few other things that, uh, that you talked about. Um, Evolution, you talk about imperfect cloning. Okay, I get imperfect cloning. But again, here's the issue. You have to have new information added to the genome. That is a benefit to that organism so that as time goes on, that organism can survive, re, you know, reproduce, and then pass its genes on next generation and that they should be better. Why? Because you went from a single cell to all the complexity that we see today. That's why. And again, no transitional fossils. You compare a mouse pod and a fin for complexity, whatever. I mean, you're showing us pictures. What's the mechanism for this to work? Again, there is no mechanism. Evolution is macroevolution is not scientific. Speciation is not macroevolution. I've never heard this definition before. Speciation always has belonged to microevolution. The thing we would agree on is when we look at Ken Ham's drawings, um, which any of us young earth creationists would, would believe is that, is that if two animals can reproduce like a lion and a tiger, they can reproduce and have a progeny. Well, then they would be of the same created kind. Yeah, we, we have no problem with that. We would agree that that is speciation. That's, and we would agree that they're the same created kind. Macroevolution is higher than that. It has to go to how do you get the single cell to the complex organisms that we see today. And uh, on that, I know my time is, is just about up. And, you know, again, again, I'm just waiting for any type of evidence that shows how evolution could be scientifically possible. Time. Okay, let me bring Patrick in. So what we'll do here now is um, start with Patrick. Um,
<clears throat> Let me just reset the clock here. Patrick, you'll have one minute to ask a question. It's, and it's just so you remember, it's it's not a time for statements. It's time to sure to ask questions. Um, let me just reset the clock. And then Anthony, you will have two minutes to answer. What I'm going to do, just make it easier so I can reset. I'll start. I'm going to leave two minutes on the clock, but you'll have one minute to ask the question and then two minutes to answer. So uh, we'll have a total of 10 minutes for this. So I have to just keep my other clock. Give me one sec. I should have had that ready. All right. All right. So we're, we got uh, you ready for your Question. Can you hear me? I just saw a message pop up. I don't know if it's old or new. Oh it's, yeah, I, I can hear you. Yeah, we, okay. we can hear you. You ready? Yeah, I sent you the message way before yeah. when when you dropped. Yeah, it. I, I didn't know if it was an older one. Yeah. Okay. okay. You ready for your first for your questions? I'm first. Yep. You get you get okay. one minute to ask a question. Anthony has two minutes to answer. You can then ask your second question up until ten minutes. Okay. All right. Ready. Sure. Go. Well, in terms of evolution and, and consistent reproduction, uh, we biologists see cats and reptiles in the same kind. Uh, beyond being cats or reptiles, there are uh, amniotes, which is demonstrable, by the way. Uh, they also have four limbs. They're tetrapods, also obviously demonstrable. Is there a question coming? Uh, question, yes. Okay. Uh, so you said cats always produce cats, all the standard examples uh, right there. Uh, do vertebrates always produce vertebrates? Well, it's not a good question because on one hand, vertebrates would always produce vertebrates, but it's only be, but that's too macro of a level vertebrates in general. There's no, there's no animal that's called a vertebrate, right? So it's, it's, it's a cat or a dog or a name, some other vertebrate. And yeah, um, in within that kind that are vertebrates, they can reproduce within that own kind. Okay. What what's the format next for your next question? Okay, you keep asking. There's 20 minutes of questions, right? I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, if I if I deviate or do something wrong, be, let me know. Uh, an example of a uh, fish fin or a, and and the mouse paw. Uh, they're actually issues there, but let's, let's just get to the question. Um, which is more complex? So evolutionists think all tetrapods as exemplified by the, uh, mouse paw, uh, derived from sarcopterygian lobe fin fish. And as a consequence of monophyly, all tetrapods are technically classified as lobe fin fish. I know you're going to balk at that, and creationists don't like to hear that. Uh, up, you didn't ask we, the so. Okay, if we, if we think tetrapod limbs derived from lobe fin fish, I guess obviously the 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 increase in information went from fish fin to mouse limb. Is that correct? Is is a mouse limb more complex than a fish fin, and how so? <laughs> Well, the problem with the question is that when we when we would argue about or make arguments about complexity, we would be looking at what evolutionists have historically said are the earlier life forms that have evolved into the more complex life forms. So I would I pers I, I don't believe it's a valid question looking at two different kinds of animals and determining one is more complex than the other. The thing that we're concerned about is that they both are really complex compared to what scientists, some scientists, evolutionary biologists believe um, were the organisms of billions of years ago, and that they're more complex 
than all of its ancestors going all the way back two billions of years ago. So that's really the complexity that we're concerned with. And um, and that's where we see nothing in between the simple to the to the really complex. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism? For our tense and purposes, um, nothing. That's not right. Not for my purposes. Which one so, is the scientific? Which one is the scientific method based on? Okay, so re repeat your question then, because I'm I'm on a different track than okay. you. I think. What's the difference between philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism, and okay. which one is the scientific method based on? Well, scientific method would be on your on the second one, not the first one. Okay. Which one does evolution exemplify? The first one. It's a it's a philosophical argument, not a scientific one. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned earlier uh, random chemical reactions obeying the laws of chemistry and physics. Uh, I would just like that's a little bit of contradiction. I think if you'll think about that for a second uh, and I'd like give you a chance to clarify that. What do you need clarification on? What What's the question? How, how do random things obey laws? You said random chemical reactions obeying the laws of chemistry and physics. Well, that doesn't, that's contradictory. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I, so I would agree. And that's why I said that. It, that's why okay. I clarified when I, when I said okay, this. You did. Okay. Random, I'm sorry. Yeah, random chemical reactions. I said doing nothing but obeying laws of chemistry and physics. And so in my, in my, um, in, in my um, statement was that I'm not even going to make you account for where these natural laws came from, laws of chemistry and physics. We're just going to assume they're there, even though in technically I shouldn't assume that they're there either in your worldview. I should, I should, yeah. I should pin you down and say, where are, where do the natural laws come from? And where does your ability to have all of these things, you know, your ability to reason and think everything come from? Because otherwise, the evolutionary worldview, if you take it back far enough, must start at a place that is just random chemical reactions in dirt, in palm scum, in something that somehow arose and it to the products that somehow formed into the first cell. Okay. Is that over? Yeah. I feel like we should be on... Uh... CBs or walkie talkies. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should start, just say, start saying 1040 when I'm done. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Let's talk about uh, the Darwin quote. Did you, are you aware that's a quote mine? That I took his quote? Yeah, I, I do. I actually yeah. have it in my book. Okay. The missing transition, the missing transitional fossils. Yep. Uh, it's in chapter 10. The quote mine. Of his book. What, is, what does he go on to say? Oh, he goes on to say lots of other stuff, but, but his point, his point stood, he still believed that they would find him one day. And I, and, and I, have. I don't, I, I, I don't have a problem with his, with the way he wrote his book. I'm just saying that it's a hundred and almost 60 years later and we're still looking for him. Right. So, so first off, uh, do you acknowledge he was just using sort of Victorian era, language with a, a sort of a, you know, laying out a, a premise and then he would go on to discuss it. Absolutely. I, I recognize okay. that. So we, we have tons of transitional fossils and I mean, really, I don't even, I feel like I'm making, I'm deviating from the format. Let me know if I'm yeah, messing up. Yeah. You just, it's time. Yes. Yeah, okay. Question. Right. Okay. That's fine. We have tons of transitional fossils. Uh, and also, okay, let's, uh, let me look at your 
example where you talk about my cancer research, uh, are the mutations that occur in cancer cells, admittedly they're bad for the host, but uh, is it possible that the mutations that occur in cancer cells are good for the cancer cells? Do they confer a survival advantage? Uh, for example, in terms of uh, allowing them to colonize new tissues in the body or to avoid uh, being killed by chemotherapy? Not at all, because once the cancer eats out the host and the host dies, that cancer dies with it. So it has no ability to reproduce and put itself into a new host. It's gone. So if that's not evolution. Well, okay. Uh, are we not as species limited to the planet Earth? I mean, for instance, we could pollute the environment beyond recognition and it would be bad for us and we wouldn't be breeding anymore and, and reproducing. But does that really have anything to set of any relevance to whether the mutations are beneficial to us at the time, assuming, assuming we, we have mutations that are beneficial. I just, you know, get, let you ask you to give me that, uh, latitude there. Uh, well, in other words, is, is the condition of their environment, really of any relevance to whether their muta mutations are beneficial. I mean, we do, we don't expect mut mutations to have any sort of concept of uh, the long term, do we? Well, I mean, you asked a couple of questions there, so I'll ask, I'll answer yeah, your last I understand. question. Yeah, that's okay. I, I'm fine with that. I, so your last question I'll, I'll answer first in, in terms of mutations that the, the issue is, is we have genetic entropy happening, and I know you'd acknowledge that. The when we talk about the billions of years that it supposedly took from the first cell all the way up to us today, if genetic entropy was going on all this time, we never would have evolved. We wouldn't even be here having this discussion today. So, so genetic entropy would have would have flushed out some some organism billions of years ago according to the rate that it's happening today. When it comes to beneficial mutations, I would agree that the research is one in every five to 6,000 mutations is a perceived beneficial mutation. And yet in every one of those cases, such as sickle cell anemia, antibiotic resistant bacteria and others, it is, it's always a net loss of information. And it just so happens that in, in that specific time and specific environment, it has an advantage right then and there. But you, you take that antibiotic resistant bacteria and take them and put them into a normal environment. It's now at a genetic disadvantage. So, that's, so that's a good beneficial mutations don't really answer the question because again, it, my point when I, when I talked about this is that we need mutations for macroevolution, for molecules of man evolution to be viable. We need mutations that puts new information, new functional genetic information into the genome. It's the only way you can explain a simple cell billions of years ago, getting up to all the complex life we see today, including us, who's made of, you know, around a hundred trillion highly complex specialized cells. Okay. Uh, did you know that genes can actually uh, diversify and produce more copies of themselves, each maybe with one lineage retaining the original sequence and then the copied lineage uh, experiencing some mutations that would allow it to diversify into different functions. Did you, were you aware of that? Um, I, I am, and we'd be talking about the field um, uh, epigenetics and Here's, here's the thing, and, and we didn't have time to get into all of this today, um, and I won't be able to do this in the closing either, but I, w I believe that, according to the Bible, that original pair of canines, the original pair of felines, the pair, original pair of whatever parent um, or animal you want to talk about that came off Noah's Ark, they, w they had built into them not only massive amounts of genetic variability, but they also have built into them a genome that responds to the environment. There's some wonderful new studies that have been out in the last five to six years, wonderful research being done that talks about how sensors in the body 
And we see this all over the animal kingdom, plant kingdom and whatnot, where sensors can not only cause an organism to move and do things, but it can also turn off and on switches in the genome to allow certain genes to be expressed or suppressed. So we see those things happening, but it's because of information already built in the genome. So I don't have an issue with genes being able to duplicate because that, that was then in, by God's design, it would have been built into the genome. But even then, when you bring up the idea of mutations, mutations don't add new information. They, again, they either recombine already existing information or it's a net loss of information. And even the times it recombines, it typically ends up being a negative to the organism. So it still doesn't answer the question at all in terms of is evolution scientifically possible. Okay, how is the information content of, uh, are, you, are you talking about maybe a genetic sequence here, uh, a string of three A's and three T's, and then you seen somewhere in the middle, would that constitute new information? I mean, if we're measuring uh, nucleotides as sort of being synonymous or analogous to bits, uh, mm -hmm. would that constitute new information? Well, probably not. And the reason why is because while it looks really cool in textbooks, when we see this double helix of DNA, you know, along our, uh, our textbook pages, and we see all those bits that you're talking about of information in that genome, as you and I both know, that doesn't make DNA functional. Functional DNA is when you have that double helix strand that's actually twisted and tied up into a three-dimensional shape. So that means that because it's, th it's a three-dimensional shape and it's kind of twisted up in different ways, think of like, um, for anybody out there listening, if you've got uh, a pair of earphones, right? You can take earphones and hold them up, you know, right in front of you. But if you jumble them together and throw them in a drawer, what happens? You go pick them up a week later and you've got to untangle them, right? Well, when you tangled them, that strip of headphones when it's tangled up you have parts of the bottom strip that may be overlapping part of the middle strip and part of the top of the strip overlapping a part of the three quarters of the way down on the strip there's a three-dimensional shape and structure to this to which those genes turn off and on other genes so it's actually it's yeah it's actually far more complicated than just saying what i even said today where we need mutations that increase functional genetic information. Not only do you need mutations that somehow increase functional genetic information into that double helix, into that genome, you also have to have it make sure that it doesn't mess up the, when it's in its three-dimensional shape, mess up the off and on and regulator genes that come from other areas of the genome that just so happen to overlap that part of the genome when it's folded in this three-dimensional shape. So when you have all when you have all those factors put into place, and not only that, in genetics, we we call it four-dimensional because that three-dimensional structure can change shape, like in liver cells, depending on what type of toxin it has to excrete. It's so complex. Time. Okay. You you still have three minutes left for questions. Oh, okay. Uh, so information may or may not be calculated or measured on a nucleotide basis like the number x number of nucleotides is greater than y number of nucleotides therefore it has more information is that correct or incorrect well i think in a very 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 simplistic view or simplistic model you can say that, but it's not going to apply to every situation. Now, of course, I use this, what you're saying right now, I use this in my own book in talking about the differences between a chimpanzee genome versus a human genome and why it would have been impossible for all of those changes to occur um, between a human and, a, or I'm sorry, between not a chimpanzee, but you know, it would common be our answer. common ancestor. Sure. But, okay. but using a chimpanzee genome, we can still get an idea with how vast the differences are. I and mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of base pair differences. So I use that as an example in my book simplistically, and I can demonstrate how evolution is not scientifically possible in given amount of time for that, let alone the fact that your, your example and what I'm talking about here, it's, it's, that's way too simplified because of the fact that genomes are folded into three-dimensional shape with 
ability to regulate one itself and the ability to actually change shape in certain circumstances. Like I said, liver cells, when they're, when they're trying to get rid of toxins, you see, you see this, you see thing, you see these, uh, the genome being able to fold in different ways. I mean, it's, it's incredible again, all by design by God, um, not from randomness over billions of years. Okay. So we have time for one more question, one minute left. So I'm going to try to try to boil everything down here. Sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. Were you finished? Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, you don't think evolution is scientifically possible because the only proposed mechanism is, is mutations for generating genetic diversity. Uh, and you tack on the need for increasing complexity via mutations, which you think is impossible. Am I being fair up to this point? Yes, you are. Okay. But you can't give me a way to measure information or complexity quantitatively. Well, no, I said in a simple, in a very simple sense, you can use that. It's just, it's, it's much, it's much more complicated than that. But even in a simple sense, if you try to calculate it, it's impossible. Just like when I said earlier, in terms of what are the, what's the probability of a single protein um, being able to form out of, out of nothing, let alone the first living cell. So, so I have no problem with using that as, as a way to try to quantify it. The point I was trying to make is that I, to be scientific, as I said in my entire opening, to be scientific, we have to be able to apply the scientific method, which means we have to have something that we observe, test, repeat, um, verify results, right? We have to be able to do those things. It can't be done with macroevolution. You'd never observe that happening. All we can observe is certain traits being expressed within a genetic kind, like in E. coli bacteria studies or in antibiotic resistant bacteria or um, Darwin's finches, right? And they're still finches in the end with slightly different sized beaks. Um, so the issue is that where, what is the mechanism? Is there any mechanism possible for evolution to occur? Because I'm just trying to find a way to be fair to evolutionists, how can we apply a scientific method to try to make this scientific? I go as far as to say evolution is not even a theory. It can't be because you can't run it through the scientific method. And there is no, you don't have any ways, any mechanisms for evolution to occur. So you can't run that through the scientific method either, which means that it's not a theory. It's a hypothesis at best. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where I stand on it. Okay, that's time. So now it is uh, 20 minutes for Anthony to ask questions of Patrick. Anthony, you'll have one minute to ask a question. Patrick, you will have two minutes to answer. And again, if, if you feel that the question is not being answered, I, the question gets re-asked. Okay. okay. Ready? Go. Yep, I'm ready. And by the way, thank you, Patrick. It's been a very respectful debate. I enjoy that. So it's, uh, it's always fun to, well, to be able to I'm debate like that. Way online. I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk over you either. No, no, I was just no, not a problem. Say, I only act a certain way online when uh, I'm, I'm reciprocating uh, behavior that I get. I don't, I don't start out out of the gate like that. I don't yeah, know if that's I, what I, you're, I, but I, I get it. I get it. So, okay, okay, so here, here are some questions I'm going to ask you, Patrick. Um, number one, has it ever been observed that one kind of animal has ever evolved into another kind, such as an ape-like creature evolving to a man, or a chicken, or a bird? evolving from a dinosaur? Uh, evolution takes place over uh, several generations and the major evolutionary transitions took place well before mankind even walked the earth, before he even invented a scientific method. So that's one part of your answer. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of your answer is that apes and humans are the same kind, according to agnostic evolution. Uh, birds and reptiles are the same kind, so there's no change of kind required. And I had one other point that I was 
juggling up there at the top of my mind, but uh, I can't remember what it was. Uh, repeat your question again, and maybe it'll come to me. Yeah. Has it ever been observed that one kind of animal has ever evolved into another kind? Examples would include an ape-like creature evolving to a man, um, or a chicken or a bird evolving from a dinosaur. Well, dinosaurs went extinct before humans ever walked the earth. So, uh, my two points uh, address your. Once again, you you complained about several of my observations or questions. Uh, that's that's a bad question for uh, the two reasons that I stated. One, there's no change of kind, and two, those transitions took place uh, before humans ever walked the earth, and there's no reason to expect a major, uh, what, what a creationist would call a change of kind to occur in the present day. Uh, a lot of the major transitions that you... Time for the answer. Sorry, sorry. go ahead. Nope. Okay, that, okay, that's enough. So for a yes, here's a yes or no question. So just to clarify, have you, has any human ever observed one of these things happening? What has it, has it ever observed one kind evolving into another kind? Okay. Well, what, uh, creationists would, uh, where they would draw the, the line in terms of a, of a different kind, uh, say uh, any of the examples you stated uh, any example of a kind changing another kind I, I don't care what it is i'm just asking well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't i don't i don't use the definition i don't i the, i can't wrap my head around what your, your definition of a kind is i think in clades uh so there are clay subclades within subclades that make up uh one of the three clades in in biodiversity, that being eukaryotes, you bacteria, organism member or clade. So I don't see any change of kind when we talk about. Uh, uh, so, for all are also vascular plant seed plant that isn't a vascular plant, but in terms of evolution, being a vascular plant is a prerequisite to the evolution of seed plants. Uh, I don't know where you draw the line in terms of kinds for that. It's just, it just makes, it doesn't, I can't wrap my head around it. Like I said, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. Okay. Did a mammal, was it ever observed that a fish um, turned into a human being? Because that's in that is a claim of the evolutions. Sure, humans are tetrapo tetrapods. Obviously, the genetic basis for uh, tetrapod limbs uh, is resident. It's still uh, you can still sort of suss it out. You can sort you know with with tweezers. You can trace it out of the uh, genetics of some lobe finned fish. Others you can't, so they're not direct. They're not closely related. You know, they're not in the same lineage of ancestry. But no one's ever observed that. That occurred in the Devonian period, appro approximately 485 million years ago. There weren't any humans around. But technically, humans are classified as lobe finned fish. Uh, yeah, so I know classified. I, I, I'm, I'm just asking if it was yeah, ever. Nope. There's no, I mean, there's no, it's no, it's not ever been observed, right? So it's not ever been observed. Yeah. You can observe it genetically. Okay. Fair, fair enough. So, um, in, in when bacteria develop resistant antibiotics, what do they turn into? Uh, a strain or a subspecies of the same bacteria uh, based on the law of monophyletic restriction, or excuse me, I mispronounced that little dry mouth, monophyletic restriction, 
we wouldn't expect them to turn into anything else, uh, especially just based on a variation in a single trait. Okay. Uh, fair fair enough. Um, when, the flu mutate, is, when the flu mutates every and, year, uh, Anthony, you, let him finish. He still well, I, I, well, I, mean, I was going to make. I was going to make a, super, a sort of accessory point, but it's really not necessary. Go ahead. Go ahead. Wuhan virus from China. Excuse me. I'm being racist. Uh, COVID nineteen from China isolate is still a coronavirus nineteen. Uh, if you compare the, an, Ameri an isolate from an American patient, uh, that's, that's just too short a distance to, I mean, they're a major change, but you wouldn't expect that coronavirus to ever change into anything else. Biologists are aware of a phenomenon ca called monophyletic restriction, you know. Yeah. Okay. We're um, turn and we wouldn't expect it to. So... We look at, um, so like DNA, there's many other coding systems out there. And so one of those would be, so a working coding system like computer code, right? Have, do you know of any, any working coding system anywhere in the universe that has ever come about without an intelligent designer? Well... I can't even think of a uh, working computer computer code that wasn't designed by a human. So uh, I guess the answer to your question is no. Yeah, I, I would agree. So is DNA infinitely more complex? Or at least I shouldn't say infinitely. Is it much more complex than any computer code? Sure. Yeah, I would agree. So by logic, if if all working coding systems like computer codes must have had a designer, would it logically follow that DNA must also have an intelligent designer? No. Why not? Because it's a chemical. Because humans design computer codes if your premise is that humans design dna and you know if you verify that it is exactly analogous to a computer code rather than just a convenient metaphor for relaying some of the attributes that it has then this would be a reasonable topic Um, you have, you have to, any guess? Have, I'm sorry. Are you, you have to demonstrate that it is exactly analogous to a computer code, exactly comparable, or um, can't think of the word. Well, I, I mean, I would think it's very analogous because there's information loaded into both of those. Well, it's, it's analogous and it's a metaphor, but uh, they're not the same thing. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask this question then. Uh, in a in a human being, we've got something like three billion letters of DNA information, right? Um, how could mutations, accidental copying mistakes, create the huge volumes of information in the DNA of living things? Again, you go from a single celled organism that actually would have had DNA in it. Um, how mm -hmm. did that How did that DNA even evolve? itself, let alone um, how does mutations add information to get the DNA that we have today? Okay, well, uh, this goes back to the distinction between the biochemical origin of cells or their genetic systems or their uh, organelles versus uh, the theory of evolution, which is the facts and theories concerning the generation of biodiversity. Uh, mutations don't create genomes. They create genome diversity. Uh, so, you know, if you want to talk about evolution, you know, you want to talk about how one 
you go to your co local college campus, you talk about evolution, you go to your biology department, how genomes are related, how we can infer that whales are mammals and thus necessarily whales derived from tetrapod four-limbed ancestors that were also mammals. That's one set of questions. But if you want to talk about how the first genomes uh, or the first sets of genetic instructions uh, originated and, you know, how sets of genes accumulated into the first replicating cells, you need to go over to your biochemistry department. There's a little bit of overlap between those two areas, but we don't use the same techniques and we don't study the same things. And like I keep saying, evolution doesn't explain why the sky is blue nor does it explain the question you just asked me, nor does it meant to. Okay, but if mutations are the way that evolutionists, it's the mechanism that all evolutionists point to as the bottom like base function for um, new information to be put into a genome, mm -hmm. I'm just asking how can mutations possibly have put new information into DNA over billions of years. What is the mechanism for it? Well, we, you can do that. You can do like, you can clearly, uh, I don't, you know, first of all, you need to establish what information is, what constitutes information. So uh, let's go back to the coronavirus example. We have sequences that came out early on from isolates in China and we can derive a sequence from a new isolate from someone in Chicago tonight, and they're gonna vary. Some of those, uh, uh, the characteristics of each isolate are, might vary as well in terms of infectivity. Uh, obviously the, the change from bat or uh, pangolin or whatever animal it was to human involved some addition of information via mutation. We might not be able to say exactly what mutation uh, contributed to a jump and it's probably more all in all likelihood more than one mutation. So this is a you know it's a very slippery slope. You have to be able to say what the information is and then you want to say mutations can't contribute can't add information, but then you have to say, well, what did that information do? And if you know what what that particular change is, say being able to go from infecting bats, only bats to humans, then you can sometimes find specific nucleotide differences that contributed, contributed to that shift. Say it allows interaction with a, a re receptor on a human cell as opposed to a bat cell. You know, and if that doesn't conform to your information, to your definition of information, I don't know what to tell you. If you want to talk about broader macroscopic changes, like, say, going from chordates to vertebrates, Sorry, then that's more than one change. That's more than one mutation. Many, many, many more. Um, how much time is left, Andrew? A total of uh, five minutes, 24 seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. I, I think I'm going to get away from this for a moment. <clears throat> so you had a picture in the beginning of, of a uh, coelacanth, right? And coelacanth mm -hmm. is, is an ancient fish right. that died off supposedly 65 million or so years ago. But then somewhere around 80 years ago, we found one off the coast of, uh, I don't know which continent anymore, but <laughs> we found a coelacanth again. And he was right. remarkable about it. It's over 65 million years, it didn't change. It looks the exact same according to the fossils of 65 million years ago to today. Well, so, so Patrick, how do we explain living fossils? Because I can rattle off numerous, numerous fossils. I mean, from... from um, uh, spiders to again coelacanth to starfish to frogs. Right. Um, yeah, your question. Okay. I, so all these are out here, and they look the exact same today, or really, really close, where they'd be the same kind. That's they look the, the same today as they did millions to hundreds of millions of years ago. How is that to be the case if evolution is 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 something that happens? Okay. 
Well, the the problem with the 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 coelacanth example is that what uh, people mistake or call it being a living fossil is really just uh, being ambiguous and, and sort of fuzzy in their acknowledgement of a species versus a genus versus a family. The living two genera, I believe, maybe they might be from the same genus, I can't recall off the top of my head. Uh, they are two species from the Indian Ocean and off the co coast of Madagascar. They actually do look very similar, but our fossil coelacanths are very diverse in terms of body plan. Uh, they also inhabited different habitats. So, you know, a lot of freshwater coelacanths, uh, near shore environments, uh, a lot of different fan arrangements and morphologies. Uh, so really you're just sort of, you know, and I don't blame people for not understanding, but it's really just conflating, confl conflating extinction of other genus, other species and genera with one that happened to survive that no one noticed for a long time because it lived in the very deep ocean. You know, there are parts of the deep ocean we don't know a whole lot about and we're always discovering new animals in those uh, habitats as well. Um, so it's the, the no change, uh, the living fossil fallacy, as I like to call it, uh, can be explained by just having a better understanding of the diversity of coelacanths in the prehistoric time versus our one or our two living examples nowadays. And they're not really similar to the uh, fossils that we do have, that, uh, the ones that we have fossils right. for. Okay. Anthony, let, okay. As a follow-up, one more question. What's that? You probably have time for one more question. Okay. Two minutes left, unless he answers question. Okay. As a, um, okay. So from in your coelacanth example here, um, when it comes to human beings, the ancestor that we supposedly diverged from, so the common ancestor with a chimpanzee, was supposedly somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of million years ago. And that means that we would have added hundreds of millions of base pair differences into the genome from that mm. common ancestor to humans today. We would look very different than what that was. I mean, we don't look anything like um, so what, what, evolutionists purport as being transitional fossils. Why is it that we look very different even in just a couple of supposed you know millions of years of evolution, but yet the coelacanth looks virtually no different, even though you may call it subspecies? Why is it the frog looks virtually no different, even though you may call those subspecies? These things don't look different. And yet they would have been for 60 to 100 million years in, in the case of a lot of these living fossils between how well the fossil was dated to what we mm -hmm. see actually living today. Mm -hmm. Why did the evolution not occur? Well, uh, evolution, first off, evolution isn't predicated on physical change. Uh, sometimes that's all we have to work with, especially if we're looking at fossils. Uh, once again, I just really want to go back and correct you. That's just, that's not correct. The coelacanth, that we have two living species of today are nothing like our fossil coelacanths, except if you were to go back and find a fossil of the current living species at some time point. Um, and once again, you're talking about why don't we see change? Uh, once again, I just chalk that up to uh, a lack of understanding or a lack of living biodiversity. And when it comes to humans, we're looking at the hominin line and there are human homo sapiens, which are alive today, homo neanderthalensis, which could, you know, which is still a human, it's in the genus homo and several others that, you know, I don't feel like rattling off the names, including uh, within the genus homo and then several species within the genus Australopithecus. Those are all hominins, and the ones that have are in the genus Homo are humans. So I think we would all have a very different idea of evolution and be 
a little more uh, accepting of it if there were more examples of living biodiversity that we're familiar with. And the same thing goes for animals. You know, we're not familiar with the, you know, simple chordates and say the egg laying mammals like the platypus and echidna that uh, other people are, are familiar with, you know, that may live in those specific areas. So I don't agree that there's Fine. a lack of diversity. Okay. So that's time. We're going to go to uh, put Anthony in timeout. I just like saying that. All right. <laughs> Bad boy. <laughs> and I'm going to reset the clock to 10 minutes. You'll have, you'll have 10 minutes for your closing remarks. Are you ready? Yes. Let's, is my screen showing or my, uh, I'm just going to go back to my PowerPoint to address a few things. Sure. Um, sort of, I'm going to improvise a closing statement. How long do I have again? You have 10 minutes. Okay. You ready? Yeah. All right. Go. Okay. I believe this was the last slide. Okay. So, you know, I mean, you, you can talk about uh, evolution, whether evolution is scientifically possible. Uh, I don't really understand using the biblical basis for whether it is, which you have done, which my opponent has done as a, a, a measuring stick of whether something scientific uh, I like to use results-based, uh, you know, uh, lines of reasoning. Uh, evolution, bioinformatics, medicine, biotechnology, all produce results, and in many cases, they produce profit. They put money in people's pockets. You know, unfortunately, a lot of times, it's not the right people. It's not the people on the ground floor doing the hard work, but they, they produce profits. And if these were just, if, you know, evolution was just a random thing, even because you hated God, uh, it would be just a huge stroke of luck that you took this gamble on this worldview and then it put results in your pocket. Okay, now I know in medicine we're talking about things like antibacteria or even the uh, ways that and evolutionary relationships and lineages is being used to, to in the epidemiology of the coronavirus right now. And I know you were going to just call the evolution, but there are wonderful th medical school. Uh, I always like to go back to the example of Neil Shubin. His exploration team went and camped out at the Arctic several years, in, you know, in Greenland, several years in a row. They found the transitional fossil Tiktaalik. There's an example of a, a transitional fossil that someone found that actually does exist, uh, contrary to what my opponent said. Uh, but for his day job, he actually works at University of Chicago Medical School, you know, and it's not like he has a, a clear line, okay, a clear line. Well, when it's summer and warm, I go study fossils in Greenland, and then for my day job, it pays the bills, I go teach gross anatomy to medical students uh, at the, you know, at the med school. You know, his research disciplines that he uses the fossils for and the stuff that his uh, lab does, you know, at the bench in the wet lab, so to speak, are integrated. One branch informs the other. So he's he looks at the the fish, the fish fin, the lobe fin, fish fin to limb transition, and then in his day job in his lab, he's looking at the genetic basis that converts converted fish fins to tetrapod limbs. And this just isn't some pie in the sky pursuit. Obviously it requires funding and you need to back up the, the, the funding when you're asking for people for money to do these research projects. And 
the reason that they tend to fund these research project is, projects is because they have practical value. And, you know, obviously if he's looking at the, the fish fin to tetrapod limb transition, he's looking at the stem cells and the genetic uh, programming, if you will, that dictates those, uh, dictate that dictated that evolutionary trend. And if you're looking at stem cells, then that just blossoms into all sorts of uh, stem cell therapies, uh, things like that. You know, I, I guess the far-fetched scientific thing would be, you know, regrowing limbs or regrowing uh, organs or, you know, doing organ transplant, transplant, transplant <coughs> transplantation. So they're practical results driven uh, uh, impetuses for pursuing evolution as a, as a line of research. It's not just some philosoph philosophical uh, fantasy. Okay, and let's talk about the difference between observational and uh, historical science uh, and whether evolution, even though you can't see macro changes happening in real time, whether you can make theories or you can make you can inform hypotheses and then go test them based on things like the fossil record. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, you're never going to be able to find, and I like to work on plants or use plants as an example because it's something people have ready access to. You can go outside right now. You can find uh, seed plants that are flowering and you can find seed plants that are non-flowering, but you're never going to find a seed plant of either type that isn't also a vascular plant. So the inference is that vascularization preceded seeds in the evolutionary history of plants. We can go and confirm that. You can go back and find the earliest, you know, that vascular plant fossils, such as those of ferns, preceded gymnosperms, which would be something like a, a cedar tree, and angiosperms, a tree that produces flowers. Okay, so you can make hypotheses and then test them using other uh, disciplines. You have to be synthetic and comprehensive in your approach. You can't just say observational science requires eyewitnessing. That's a fallacy. How much time do I have left? Damn it. I have time. Are you hearing me? <sighs> Lord. We can hear you. You have three minutes and five seconds. Can you hear us? Yep, I'm back. All right. What were... uh, we, 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 heard, we heard everything, even... The, the foul language right. I see you're trying to come again. Right, um, I, well, I only it, said that because I didn't think I was still on. Yep. No, you're on. Uh, so go go ahead on 20 seconds to start this up again. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we can do the same thing with uh, uh, the evolution of uh, metamorphosis in, in insects. Obviously, that's something we're not going to witness. That's something we're not going to witness. Okay. I don't think there's any point in, in continuing on. Uh, first off, given the technical difficulties, and secondly, I just heard my voice rapidly repeated, yeah, and I really, yeah, no, I really hate this. You came. You I came, really hate. Tried that. To, you had tried um, to come in. A, um, you should be good now. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. You got three more minutes. Or not. He just dropped out. Okay. I will reset the time. I'll bring Anthony in. Uh, and Anthony, you'll have 10 minutes. You ready? Yeah. I. If he comes in, um, I may want to repeat <laughs> some of this, but, um, or I hope that I hope we send it to him so he can listen to this afterwards. Sure. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are still listening, um, first of all, um, I have not used the Bible as a measuring stick. Let's make, let's be clear here. Um, 
Hey, okay. I'll so call you, back. So I'll, I'll start. You, can we start again, Andrew? Yeah, so you, you, well, okay. Patrick, you still have three minutes. Did you want to? Well, yeah, let Patrick finish. Yeah, I can, I can wrap it up. Okay. Let me, uh, let me give him his three minutes. And uh, let's see. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Go for it. Okay. This is just another example of how we don't have to witness we, we have to witness things through eyewitness observation. Uh, just something to add to that. That's one of the most, most unreliable forms of uh, witness testimony in, uh, in courtrooms. So it's better to be able to coordinate different lines of evidence. So one of those would be the genetic differences between different types of metamorphosis in insects. So not all insects go through the larva, the egg larva pupa stage to adult. Uh, we have ametabulous insects, which as the name implies, don't have metamorphosis. And then hemimetabulous, where they sort of go through an intermediate form of uh, metamorphosis. So there's right there is a continuum or a gradual series of uh, different types of metamorphosis that has an evolutionary basis. You might say, well, those are just different types of evolution that they were made that way, but we can go into the fossil record and find examples of ametabulous insects uh, that are the oldest insect fossils. And then we can find uh, examples of intermediate hemimetabulous insects that are a bit younger. And, and then just insect fossils are all representatives uh, of uh, holometabulous insects that have the egg larva uh, pupa adults uh, series. Now, that's not to say that these don't overlap once they originate, but we can find the earliest examples in a clear graded hierarchy that goes from ametabulous to holometabulous insects. And that's all. Am I still with you? Yes, you have another minute if you want. Um, I don't. Okay. I will bring. No, I'm in. good. Okay, bringing Anthony in. I'll put you in backstage. I got to reset the clock for you so that. Actually, we should just leave you at the three minutes. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You ready? I've done listening to me already. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank my opponent, Patrick, and our moderator, Andrew. I also want to thank everyone who's listening. I pray that if you're a Christian, this debate has been edifying for you. If you're not a Christian, I pray that you see the eternity-altering error of believing in, a, in the God of evolution and secular science, because yes, it is a religion too. Um, I've not, according, you know, Patrick says I... I use the Bible as my measuring stick. It's not my measuring stick. As a Christian, the Bible is my sole source of authority. So you could throw all the evidence you want at me about evolution. That's fine. And I'm still going to rely on what the Bible tells me versus what fallen man will tell me. But that wasn't the issue of the debate today. The issue of the debate today was I asked for any evidence whatsoever for evolution to be scientifically possible, right? That was the debate. Is evolution scientifically possible? And so because as Patrick admitted, finally, later on, um, uh, he admit, <laughs> I think we had to squeeze it out of him, but he admitted you can't observe this, right? Because supposedly it happened many years ago, so we couldn't have observed any macroevolutionary issues or macroevolution happening. So instead, I said to make it scientific, just give me a mechanism. Just let's test. Let's observe, let's observe if there's any possible mechanisms. Let's test those mechanisms to see if we can find any scientific evidence for evolution. And the only way to do that in the here and now is through mechanism, some type of mechanism. And so this is what I asked. I've established, and this is what I established, right? I established today that the mechanism for molecules of man evolution to theoretically work is through mutations. It's the only way that it can occur, but it's not through any mutations. It's one, it's ones that um, have to increase functional genetic information over time. That's it. It's the only way that it's going to occur to go from a single cell to the complex organisms we see today and all of the fossil records 
we have to have information added to the genome. Have, have there ever been any observed mutations that have increased functional genetic information? And the answer is no, there's never been any, it's zero. Let me repeat, there's never been a mutation that's ever been shown to increase functional genetic information. Every mutation, whether beneficial, neutral, or negative, has really displayed a net loss of information or just a recombining of information that is already present. And when we look at the Noah's Ark example, where and, and the tree orchard versus the one tree of life that the evolutionists believe in, we look at the amount of variability in in the original dog kind that came off the ark, that same dog kind that produced wolves and dingoes and all of the breeds of dog we see today came from one original pair. Let's talk about the genetic variability for this to occur because you've got to have a lot of variability, a lot of information already built into the genome that allows those dogs to speciate out. If we look at a husband and a wife, they have enough genetic variability that they could have 10 to the, get this, 2017th power. That's a one with 2017 zeros after it. Bef they could have that many children before they're guaranteed to produce an identical one. That's how much variability is in a human being, let alone what do you see in the genetic variability in all these animals? It's easy to conceive how you get all these different speciations and subspecies within a created kind by God. I also pointed out that uh, not only do we have this catastrophic problem in evolution where there is no mechanism that has ever been shown, ever been observed to be able to prove that evolution is even possible scientifically, that's not the only problem. As I stated in my opening, that they always start with a single cell, the simple, what they call the simple single cell. Why? Um, because they have no idea how a cell could have come out about in the first place. So of course they have to start there and try to make up more fairy tale information, starting from the cell, going into how we get to human beings of today. They also can't explain where all the matter in the universe came from in the beginning. Again, it goes against all science, as I stated in my opening. <sighs> Evolution's starting point notice is always billions of years ago, millions of years ago, long ago. Once upon a time, well, guess what? Every fairy tale also starts the same way. This just so happens to be the one that some adults use that hate God. This debate, in reality, was not a debate about whether molecules of evolution is scientific or if it's scientifically possible. This is really a debate about worldviews. Because Patrick claimed to be an atheist, according to his worldview, we're the result of materialistic, naturalistic processes. We somehow evolved millions to billions of years ago from random chemical reactions that are doing nothing but obeying the laws of chemistry and physics today. Again, I'm not going to say where those came from. <laughs> we know it's God, but from an evolution standpoint, I'm just going to give it to him. And we're just a result then of these random chemical chance processes. That means we would be, according to the macroevolution, according to molecules of evolution, we're just bags of random chemical reactions doing nothing but obeying the laws of chemistry and physics, which is only capable of producing more chemical reactions doing nothing but obeying the laws of chemistry and physics. It does not produce logic. It does not produce ability to speak and think and reason like Patrick did today, whether we agree with his assessments or not, of which I obviously don't. I don't believe Patrick gave a single good answer today. I, I think he avoided every one of my questions in terms of mechanism. He kept showing more pictures, which is all evolutionists are really trained to do. This is what I was trained to do years ago um, before I was taught to ask questions that penetrate just a little bit past surface level. But I go further. Was there even a point purpose of listening to Patrick at any point today? Because in his worldview, we really should have just shut off the volume and gone and gotten a snack and, and ate it because his words would have just been the result of random chemical chance processes doing nothing but obeying laws of chemistry and physics if we believe his worldview. But of course we listen to him. Why? Because we know that that's not the case. We know that Patrick did, and Patrick knows this himself, he did speak with intelligible thought today. He prepared for this debate using his ability to reason, which he can't account for in his worldview. He controlled his thoughts today, which he can't account for in his worldview. He also purposefully selected his words and spoke those words today, which he also can't account for in his worldview. So how then could Patrick do this? Well, 
for the Christians in the room, it's because he's made in the image of God who gave him the ability to do all these things and much more. Romans 1 clearly states that everyone knows the true God that exists by his creation and the things that have been made. I point out some wonderful signs today about this wonderful genome. It's obvious designed. We have a computer code that is obviously designed. Patrick admitted that. He also admitted that the, that the human genome is way more complex than a computer code. And yet somehow there's a disconnect and not understanding that that was also designed, not just by a human, because a human could never design DNA. That is designed by God, the one who has all knowledge, the infinite being is who designed DNA. Romans 2 verifies something also that's very important in this world. Romans 1, everyone knows true God that exists. Romans 2 is that the moral laws are in everyone's heart. That includes mine and that includes yours, Patrick. But Romans 1 also tells us that many people, including Patrick here, suppress the truth about God. How? Well, it says in Romans 1, in their unrighteousness, sin causes the unbeliever, as it did to me in my past, it causes the unbeliever to do the same thing Adam and Eve did when they sinned at the beginning of time about 6,000 years ago. The unbeliever attempts to hide from God. Yet even in this hiding, by suppressing the truth about God, they'll still be held accountable to him without excuse on Judgment Day. Patrick, I agree to do this debate only because you pretend to be an atheist. You know as well as I do that you're created in the image of God and have broken God's laws at least thousands of times in your life. Every time you've lied, stolen something, committed adultery in your heart by lusting after a woman, committed murder in your heart by committing murder in your heart by hating someone um, or speaking ill of someone, you've broken God's law. And for our law breaking, for your law breaking, you deserve the same way I would deserve nothing but the almighty wrath in God, a wrath of God in hell for eternity, as our sins are against the eternal creator God. But in his grace and mercy, God himself took on flesh and lived the life we're not capable of. Went to the cross to die through his death, burial, and resurrection. Pay that penalty in full for those who repent and believe. Patrick, I pray today that you cry out to God, that he grants you repentance and faith. This isn't about evolution anymore. This is about your salvation. This is about where you're going to spend eternity. Look, you you said earlier today something about um, holy hell or or something like that to, or, or Jesus. I can't remember what the what the phrase was, but it shows the suppression of truth. And I will say one last thing. You said snakes were legless lizards. Well, guess what? So does the Bible. You can read that in Genesis 1 through 3. All right. Well, that is time. And I just want to thank uh, both Anthony and Patrick for coming in and doing this debate. Um, it is, it's always good when we have debates that are done and people are uh, respectful. Uh, so that's, I appreciate both of them. Uh, I, I didn't want to say this at the beginning because so I would never be accused of um, poisoning the well. But the way this debate occurred was the fact that uh, there, Anthony, he mentioned his book several times. He just never mentioned the title, by the way, or where you can get it. So I will give a shout out to that. His book is called On the Origin of Kinds, and you can get that at strivingforeternity.org. And if you uh, get that book, you'll also realize he has a Facebook group that is also by the same name. But there is a question that you're asked to get in that Facebook group. That group is only, it is not a debate group. It is a, it is a group to discuss young earth creationism. So to get in that group, you must answer a question. Do you believe in young earth creationism? Uh, this debate started in that group, which means uh, Patrick would have had to lie to get his way into that group, or someone didn't uh, let, or let him in without answering questions. One of those two. Um, we could verify if the questions were answered if I was an admin there, but I'm sure someone else, other one of the other admins would. But that's where this debate this started in a group that was meant only for young earth creationists. And um, here we go. Brian, Brian Nine says, great book, highly endorsed. So uh, folks, if you want to get the book on the origin of kinds, I do recommend it as well, Brian. Um, Eddie says it's a great book. 
So getting some, some, some people who've read the book. So you can get that at strivingforattorney.org. Now, listen, what we're going to do, we're, we're signing out for now. Uh, this will be a podcast form as well. It'll drop tomorrow. Uh, but we're going to do a bonus episode for the podcasters. We'll also do it for those who are here. Uh, let you know we're going to do a post-debate discussion. We're going to just take about maybe five minutes to give Anthony and I a break to run and uh, we'll be back here. Uh, I've put the link in the uh, into the YouTube channel uh, for folks who are watching on Facebook or Twitter. It's going to be right back up there. If you're watching on YouTube, go to uh, youtube.com slash striving for eternity. That gets you to the YouTube channel. Uh, you're, if you're watching on YouTube, just click the link for the channel right there. And uh, we're going to have a post debate discussion, but uh, I'll put the link for folks who want to uh, join uh, for the discussion. So until next week, just remember to strive to make today an eternal day for the glory of God.